Thank you so much. Good morning, everybody, and thanks for joining us today. Um, so today we're going to talk about new employment laws for the year 2019. Uh, not surprising, what we saw last year for this year, we saw quite a few uh, statutes or regulations or amendments that had to deal with sexual harassment. Uh, obviously, that was in response to the Me Too movement and Time's Up movement. And, uh, and, and many of them are slight changes to the law, but you'll, you'll see how they relate to that. Like we're looking right now on AB 3109, Disclosure of Sexual Harassment. And, um, and this law uh, makes void and unenforceable any provision in a contract or settlement agreement that prevents a party to the agreement from testifying, testifying about criminal conduct or sexual harassment in an administrative, legislative, or judicial proceeding. So pretty much what this law says is an employer cannot request that an employee of, of sign some kind of a, a agreement that they will not testify about criminal conduct or sexual harassment that they uh, see, observe, or, or have experience in the, uh, in the workplace. And this is uh, testified in the administrative, legislative, or judicial proceeding, meaning in a lawsuit or before the DFEH or the EEOC. And this provision applies to any contracts that were entered into after January 1st, 2019. Uh, I don't see much of a difference in this provision or any significant change into um, contract because generally, even if somebody had a provision like that in an agreement, if they were served with a subpoena, they would have been compelled to testify anyways. But it just makes it clear that the legislature doesn't want employers asking their employees to sign agreements where they agree not to, not to uh, disclose any unlawful uh, or sexual harassment related behavior in the workplace. The next one we have is settlement of sexual harassment claims. This law prohibits provisions in an agreement that prevents the disclosure of factual information pertaining to claims of sexual assault, sexual harassment, gender discrimination, or related retaliation that have been filed in court or before an administrative agency. Now, the way that this usually, the, the way this used to work is like if somebody filed a lawsuit or a charge of discrimination, let's say with the EOC or the DFEH, the employer would enter into an agreement with that person who submitted a claim and then um, the agreement would have a um, confidentiality clause that would say you employee, the person who complained about the, the, the sexual harassment or sexual assault or gender discrimination, you are not allowed by signing this agreement, you're not allowed to disclose or discuss with anybody um, the basis of your complaint or, or the amount that you were paid. Uh, or, or anything about this, this uh, agreement. So we used to require full confidentiality. Um, but the legislature um, felt that it was necessary to pass this law that says you cannot do that as an employer. Okay? You cannot uh, prevent an employee who has filed a lawsuit or who has filed a charge of discrimination from discussing the basis of their complaint against the employer with other people whether they work for the same employer or not. Now, a couple of, of just uh, uh, limitations here. If the employee wants to have her or his name protected, then the agreement can provide for confidentiality concerning the name of the person who complained. But again, it's only if the employee herself or himself requests the confidentiality of the name. Now, the only thing that is allowed to be still included in such a settlement agreement would be the amount of the settlement. That can be confidential. But again, we cannot require that they keep the basis, the facts about their complaints confidential. Now, one, one item here that is very important to understand, this only applies to settlements that are reached after an employee have filed a lawsuit or a charge of discrimination which means that if you enter into an agreement with an employee who has submitted an internal report within the company, you can still require confidentiality 
of the uh, of the facts or the basis of the agreement. So uh, it, it does not apply to any situation that is pre-litigation or any private resolutions. And that's important. That's important to remember because very often um, um, attorneys or employees will send a letter of representation to an employer indicating their intent to file some kind of, of lawsuit. I think now, um, now it's important to take those letters maybe more seriously and try to resolve any issues concerning sexual assault, sexual harassment, or gender discrimination prior to a litigation or a charge of harassment or discrimination being filed with one of the agencies. Moving on to the next one, this has to do with uh, statute of limitations. Uh, you may recall over the last two, three years uh, th throughout this uh, Me Too movement that there were some incidents where um, the, the female employees complaining of sexual assault were not able to maybe file civil claims or even criminal claims because the statute of limitations had expired. So this new law has expanded the uh, statute of limitations for filing a civil action, not a criminal action, but a civil action, uh, to 10 years. But this is only concerning sexual assault, not sexual harassment. Okay, so it's very specific to sexual assault, and now a, 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 um, an individual has up to 10 years to file a civil action for damages for sexual assault, or three years after the plaintiff discover or reasonably discover injury as a result of the assault, whichever is later. Uh, again, this does not apply to criminal uh, claims. Uh, most states have their own criminal uh, criminal uh, statutes, and uh, this only applies to civil lawsuits for damages. Privileged communication. Under this new law, communications regarding sexual harassment claims are privileged. That means that the person making the statement cannot be sued for defamation of character if the statement is made in good faith and without malice. Again, the intent of the law here is to um, uh, tell employees it, it's okay. You have no reason to fear a claim of defamation or, or, or somebody accusing you of filing uh, threatening to file some kind of claim because you want to complain about some kind of sexual harassment conduct. Now, remember, you should know, though, that it says in good faith and without malice. So obviously, if somebody makes an accusation of sexual harassment in bad faith and with malice, then this law would not apply. It, again, this is, this is to tell employees, if you have any concerns about sexual harassment, don't have fear of retaliation. Don't be afraid that somebody may threaten you to file some sort of claim against you. As long as that complaint is made in good faith and without malice, your statement uh, complaining about somebody's conduct will be privileged, which means cannot be used against you. Additional communications that are privileged, a complaint of sexual harassment by an employee to an employer without malice, we just covered that, and communications between the employer and any interested persons without malice regarding a complaint of sexual harassment. So this law kind of works both ways. It also protects the employer uh, if they are doing an investigation and they are um, interviewing, investigating, talking to different people involved in the investigation, the employer will also be protected and those communications will be uh, privileged. This new law also allows employers to answer without malice whether the decision not to rehire an employee is based upon the employer's determination that the former employee engaged in sexual harassment. Now, this is, this is slightly different, and this is definitely something new. Many of you know that we generally tell employers that if you get a request for information about a former employee um, to avoid any type of def any potential defamation lawsuit against you, the prior employer, you should probably only give basic information about that employee, which generally means uh, the period of time they were employed with you, um, and the title, the, the position that they held, and sometimes 
you know, what was their last known um, compensation if you have authority to give that information. And we generally tell our clients, you know, stay away from giving too much information about the performance of the, of the employee or other information that could be used uh, uh, for a defamation claim against you at a later time. So we try to give a very neutral job reference, date of employment and title. That's ideal. Um, what was happening is that very often or many times somebody will be terminated because either they were found to have committed sexual harassment or maybe they were accused of of uh, sexual harassment and the employer maybe did not find that sexual harassment had taken place but still found inappropriate conduct. And usually that information will be not disclosed to a prospective employer, again, because of a fear of defamation claim. Under this new law, they're telling us, you employer, it's okay if you inform a prospective employer that the reason that that person is not eligible to be rehired by you is because that person engaged in sexual harassment. If um, what they what the legislation doesn't want is employers being concerned about a defamation claim and keeping this information secret. So they're giving you the okay, the green light, it's okay. If that person was found to engage in sexual harassment and you get a phone call for, for a referral after, you can tell them that's the reason that you would not rehire them. Having said all that, I would say before you do that, um, consult with counsel because um, I will use this uh, protection uh, carefully. Moving on to the next slide, we have non-supervisory employee training. Many of you know that in, an employer in California that has 50 or more employees has been required for the last 10 years, I believe, um, to provide sexual harassment prevention training to all their management personnel. It was only required for management personnel. Well, now, after the, with this new law, now employers with five or more employees must provide the two hours of sexual harassment prevention training to their management personnel. So they have definitely expanded the, uh, the scope of this statute. But in addition to that, Employers with five or more employees are also required to provide one hour of training to all non-supervisory employees. Now, this training requirement is every two years or within six months when somebody becomes a supervisor. Now, they tell us also that if you um, run an operation where you hire temporary or seasonal employees, meaning employees who work less than six months, then you must provide that training within 30 days of hire or within the first 100 hours of work, whichever occurs first. Uh, so this is a, a significant new law um, and a new requirement that is um, that applies to um, all employers with five or more employees. Other training requirements, these are very specific to industries, but um, definitely we should cover them in case it applies to uh, any of you. Uh, talent agencies, adult artists must receive educational materials on sexual harassment prevention, retaliation, and nutrition and eating disorders within 90 days of engagement. A minor cannot obtain a work permit until parents or legal guardians receive training in sexual harassment prevention, retaliation, and reporting. There's also a new statute concerning human trafficking. This one requires that all hotels or motels, they must train, they must train their employees who are likely to interact or come into contact with victims of human trafficking. This pretty much means, um, I would say probably most people that work for a hotel or a motel, meaning uh, people at the front desk, uh, housekeeping, janitorial services. Um, these individuals need to receive training concerning human trafficking. And they must receive the training within six months of hire. Thereafter, training on human trafficking awareness must be provided every two years. So very similar to the uh, sexual harassment prevention training that must be provided every two years. 
Uh, we also saw last year several amendments to the Fair Employment and Housing Act. As many of you know, that is our California state law that prohibits uh, discrimination, harassment, and retaliation. So they um, passed some amendments. Uh, one of them is an employer may not require an employee to sign a release of a claim or waiver of right covering a claim under FIHA as a condition of initial employment or continued employment or in exchange for a raise or a bonus. So the way that I've seen this in the past is that, um, let's say an employer uh, offer a promotion to an employee and they would uh, present to that employee some form of document that uh, required the employee to acknowledge that they uh, have not had been uh, victims of sexual harassment or, or discrimination or any type of discrimination or harassment, race, uh, religion, um, age. And um, it, it was a document that would say, yes, I, I have not been a victim of, of discrimination or harassment, and they would present this to an employee either on a regular basis, let's say once a year, once every six months, in exchange for continuing employment, or when somebody, like I said before, was offered a promotion. Well, under this new law, employers are not, required, are not allowed to do that. We cannot ask an employee to sign a release of claims or a waiver that they're not going to file any costs or claims in the future concerning any claim under the FIHA. So, and this is not only sexual harassment. This includes sexual harassment and any discrimination or harassment claim based on any of all the protected categories that we have under the law. Um, and as you can see there, there's a specific example at the bottom. It includes requiring an employee to execute a statement that he, she does not possess any claims or injury against the employer and the release of a right to those are prohibited. Um, this new amendment, this FIHA amendment, also prohibits employers from requiring an employee to sign a non disparagement agreement that prevents the employee from discussing in the workplace any alleged unlawful acts, including sexual harassment or any other potential unlawful conduct. So again, this says the EU employer cannot ask an employee to sign some form of agreement that says you are not going to say anything negative about your employer, or you're not going to discuss any issues that we may have in the workplace uh, of unlawful acts or illegal conduct. And of course, that would include sexual harassment. Um, the way that sometimes we will see this is if somebody claim a, a report of sexual harassment and the employer did an investigation and at the conclusion of the investigation they will require, let's say, the people who were witnesses or who had information to provide uh, in, the, in, the, in the investigation to sign some document that says you're not going to discuss this with anybody in the workplace. That is illegal. Um, now, that doesn't mean you cannot, when you do an investigation, it does not mean that you cannot re remind people that we would like to keep these claims as confidential as possible and that you uh, will expect them not to discuss them freely. What you cannot is you cannot prohibit it and you cannot have them sign a document. Um, so in a way, that really has not changed. In, in the past, I used to tell our clients, yes, you can ask the people involved in an investigation to keep the, the investigation confidential, but you really cannot require it. Remember that there, we also have federal law here that applies to employees, that protects employees, and they're able to discuss anything uh, concerning their working conditions with their coworkers. So um, not a huge impact of this new law, but definitely uh, the legislature wanted to make very clear that any agreement like that would be against the law. Now, this requirement does not apply to negotiate a settlement agreements. Okay? What this means is that if you enter into an agreement with somebody where you are uh, given some form of um, consideration, uh, 
due to a complaint filed by an employee, you can have a provision like that as long as you can show that it was negotiated. And by negotiated, it means the agreement was entered into voluntarily by the employee, and the employee was also informed about the, uh, the, this provision. The employer received some consideration of value, and the employee is giving notice and an opportunity to be represented by an attorney. If we meet all those requirements, you can have a provision of non-disparagement included in the agreement. But again, the key here is that it has to be negotiated, and it has to be voluntary. So it cannot be uh, required in exchange, let's say, for continued employment or, uh, or a promotion or things like that. It has to be part of a resolution of some form of claim. Moving on to another FEHA amendment. Um, okay, this one has expanded liability for third-party harassment. What do we mean by third-party harassment? Um, as you may know, uh, when we, uh, let's say, when we discuss sexual harassment, we, we explain that an employer uh, would be liable for damages as a result of sexual harassment by a third party, meaning not an employee, not a supervisor, but an outside person, like a vendor, like a client, a consumer, a, um, um, any, any third person that comes into contact with your employees. The employer will be responsible for sexual harassment damages if the employer knew the sexual harassment was taking place or should have known the sexual harassment was taking place. So that liability has already existed in the past. What this amendment does, it expands that liability to any type of harassment, not only sexual harassment. So it would apply if a vendor, a customer, a client is harassing your employees on the basis of age or race or disability or any other protected category. So the same uh, standard that we had before concerning sexual harassment by third parties now applies to any type of harassment under the FEHA. Again, that means under any of the protective categories listed under the FEHA. Now we can continue moving on to gender composition of board of directors. Uh, you also have heard in the last two years a lot of discussions about female employees not being paid um, equally to their counterparts, male employees. And that there's this uh, desire by the legislature to ensure that female employees are treated equally um, as male employees and that they are uh, not, that they're in the same position of authority as male employees. So this law, this new law, requires that um, female, uh, female individuals be placed on corporate boards of directors. So this is, uh, specifically it tells us that by the end of 2019, a publicly held domestic or foreign corporation that has principal executive offices in California must have a minimum of one female director on its board. And by the end of 2021, the corporation must comply with the following. If its number of directors is six or more, the corporation must have a minimum of three female directors by the end of 2021. If its number of directors is five, the corporation must have a minimum of two female directors by the end of 2021. If its number of directors is four or fewer, the corporation must have a minimum of one female director by the end of 2021. Now to ensure that publicly held corporations comply with this requirement, the legislature has uh, included in the statute pretty uh, steep fines that can be um, assessed by the Secretary of State. 
these fines start at $100,000 for violations, including for the failure to file timely board member information. So as you can see, this is something that if you are a publicly held corporation must take very seriously and make sure that you comply with that. Then uh, the, the amendment even uh, gives us a definition of what they mean by female. And female means an individual who self-identifies her gender as a woman without regard to the designated gender at birth. Moving on to lactation accommodation. This is a minor, a minor uh, revision by this uh, legislature, but it's one that needs to be uh, pointed out. Um, you may remember that uh, under existing, existing law, employers must make reasonable efforts to provide a location other than a toilet stall to be used for lactation. Now the new law says that the location should be something other than a bathroom. So we're expanding the stall, the bathroom stall, but that was the only requirement before that the employer had to make an, a reasonable effort to provide an area that was not a, a, a stall, but it could be in, in a bathroom. Now they gave, they're going uh, further and they're saying the location should be something other than a bathroom. And also, it should be a permanent location. So not a temporary location, but a permanent location for lactation purposes that is not a bathroom. Now, it does give, it give a little bit of leeway here. It can be a temporary location. If the employer is unable to provide a permanent location due to operational financial or space limitations, so the burden is on the employer to show that, yes, we would like to have a permanent location, but we cannot because of our operational financial or space limitation. The temporary location is private and free from intrusion while being used for lactation purposes. And the temporary location is not used for other purposes while being used for lactation. Now, if the employer can prove that it will be an undue hardship to comply with these requirements, the employer may still be able to provide a location, including a bathroom, other than a toilet stall for the employee to use for lactation purposes. In other words, in order to continue to do what we were doing before, the employer, meaning providing an area, a temporary area in a bathroom, the employer must show undue hardship. Undue hardship is very difficult to prove. Um, it's a pretty high standard. So even though it says if you can prove undue hardship, you can continue to do that, I highly recommend that you uh, um, do your best to try to comply with a new requirement of providing a location other than a bathroom and uh, a permanent location for lactation accommodation. Uh, PAGA relief, again, this is another narrow application of this new uh, law. It only applies to construction employers, so I'm going to cover it uh, only because we, uh, I do not know if any of you are in the construction industry. If you are in the construction industry and, you ha and your employees belong to a union, okay, that means that this statute is giving you a pass. An employee cannot file a PAGA claim against you. Now remember, two, two things that need to be met here. It has to be a construction company and the employees must be part of a union. If that is the case, an employee cannot file a PAGA claim against you. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with PAGA, that's the, um, I just forgot the name of it, the uh, Private Attorneys um, Act, which allows an employee to step into the shoes of the state of California and collect civil damages against the employer. So the, these, this is a very uh, popular, for lack of a better term, uh, claim nowadays in the state of California. Many employees uh, file not only class actions, but they also file PAGA actions, which are similar. Um, and they can recover different type of damages. They can recover statutory damages under the class action, and they can recover civil damages under the PAGA action. Uh, these are very expensive uh, claims for employers to litigate. 
uh, generally that they are concerning uh, wage and hour laws, overtime, meal and rest periods. But after this law, uh, under this law, a construction company that has employers who belong to a union will be protected against such a claim, provided that the collective bargain agreement, meaning the agreement between the union and the employer, gives the protections that are listed on this, um, on this statute. Copy of payroll records, another minor amendment, but just clarifies the law. Uh, as you, many of you may know, existing law requires that an employee, um, requires that an employer provide an employee, oh, let, let me go back and make it a little easier. That the law, existing law, requires that employees have a right to inspect or copy their payroll records and that they must be allowed to do so within 21 days of such request. So if you get a request from a current or former employee that says, I want to see, I want to review, or I want, to, I want a copy of my payroll records, meaning timesheets and payroll stuffs, the employer has an obligation to provide that information within 21 days. Now, the specific language of the statute used to say they have the right to inspect, meaning that you will, you will make them available to them, or copy their payroll uh, records, and that means that you would require the employee to make the copy themselves. So the new law clarifies that when an employee requests a copy of the records, the employer is the one who has to give them a copy of the records. Now the employer can still charge a certain, a certain um, amount per page for the, uh, uh, the cost of copying the records, but we cannot say, fine, you want a copy of the records, you need to copy them yourself. So now we must, do, we must provide a copy of the records. Again, just a small clarification. I guess there were some employers that were, that were making that requirement based on the specific language of the statute. Moving on, amendment to salary history. Again, this is also only a clarification. Um, as of January of last year, 2018, there was a law that went into effect that prevented employers from asking or relying on an applicant's salary history information for making hiring decisions. Uh, so you may recall that as of last year, January 2018, an employer that was um, interviewing an applicant for employment, they couldn't ask how much, how, what was their compensation at their prior em employer, and they couldn't use, even if they knew of, of the, comp the prior compensation, it couldn't be used as a factor to determine whether or not to hire that applicant. So this new law just gives us a little more clarification on some of those terms of that prior law. Uh, so it tells us that employer, upon reasonable request, shall provide the pay scale for a position to an applicant, right? You also may recall that, that if the applicant requested a pay scale, the employer was required to provide that pay scale for the position. So what this law does, it gives us a little bit more definition as to those terms. They tell us that the pay scale means a salary or hourly wage range. So you're only required to give them a range in the form of a salary or an hourly range. The term reasonable request means a request made after an applicant has completed an initial interview with the employer. So it's not like somebody uh, submits an application and then right away they say, can I have your salary range or your hourly wage range? The employer only is obligated to provide that information after the applicant has completed an initial interview with the employer. And then they tell us what's an applicant. An applicant is an individual seeking employment and not currently employed in any position or capacity. So it has to be somebody who's completely new to your employer, to your um, company that is considered to be an applicant. That means that it would not be somebody within your organization who's applying for a different position or a promotion. The employer can ask the salary expectation. So we cannot ask how much they were earning at their prior employment, but we can ask what is your expectation here within 
our organization. Um, there also, we also have this a statute, again, more clarification, no new law here, that says an employer may not have a disparity of pay between sexes unless the employer can show that the disparity is due to one of the following a seniority system, a marriage system, a system that measures earnings by quantity or quality, or some uh, good faith factor other than sex. Um, this just clarifies prior law. I mean, this was the laws of last year. Um, an employer cannot pay uh, uh, male employees uh, more than female employees for the same type of work that they are performing, or actually it's a little broader than that, for um, similar work that they, that, they, that they perform. Unless the employer can show that the reason the male employee is earning more is because the person has more seniority, or because the, the person that you're paying more to is because they are better employees and they deserve to earn more, or if it's based on um, how much quantity or the type of quality of production of those specific employees. So in other words, you need to have a pretty good reason and a very clear reason as to why you're paying one employee of a certain sex more than the other employee of an opposite sex who are just doing pretty much the same type of work. Contractual liability. Uh, this, again, builds on a prior law as well. Uh, this states that any contracts enter into or after January 1st, 2019 requires a direct contractor to specify in its contract all documents or information that a direct contractor will require the subcontractor to produce before the direct contractor is allowed to withhold payments for disputed sums. So with this, this applies again to the construction industry. And what this says is that if a general contractor contracts with a subcontractor or a subcontractor contracts, contracts with another subcontractor, and under current law, the general contractor or the subcontractor who is contracting with a, another subcontractor, they have liability for any wages that the sub does not pay to its employees. Okay, this is already existing law, which um, what, what it costs general contractors to do is to, to require the subs to provide information uh, as, on a regular basis to show that they were paying, that the sub was paying their employees all their wages that were owed. And that way they would avoid, the general contractor would avoid having the liability for those wages. And what would happen very often, that if a general contractor didn't, did not believe the sub was paying their employees, they would withhold monies that were due to the sub until they could see some form of proof of payment of wages. But this, this statute just barely clarifies or says, before the general contractor can withhold monies owed to the sub, the contract between them must specify in detail what kind of information the sub is expected to provide to the general contractor to show that the payment of wages. In a way, kind of made, made it a little bit fair. That means that the general contractor cannot just say, I'm withholding monies because I don't believe that you're paying your employees properly. It requires that the contract outline specifically what kind of documents are required before they can withhold that money. What we generally do with our clients, we tell them your contract should be very specific. Should be asking that the sub provide you proof of payment of wages either on a payroll period basis, like a prevailing wage job site, or maybe on a quarterly basis, um, or a monthly basis, but some procedure that uh, allows you, the general contractor, to uh, say we need to see this information if, if you want us to pay the payment that are due to you. Okay. So the contract must be very detailed. Okay, let's see. Uh, let's go for a little bit through the ABC test. Now this is not a new statute, but I included this in the presentation because there's a lot of 
discussion about the new ABC test. The ABC test resulted from a um, court decision of last uh, um, summer 2018, and that was the Dynamics Operations West versus the Superior Court uh, of LA decision. And this has to do with independent contractors and employees. Okay. There is a, um, an appeal for companies to hire individuals as independent contractors rather than employees because it's a lot easier to deal with an independent contractor. If, if the person is an independent contractor, that means that we do not have to keep timesheets, we don't have to keep payroll stubs, we, uh, we don't have to provide workers' compensation insurance. Uh, pretty much the individual comes, performs the job, and we give them a check, and then at the end of the year, we give them a 1099 instead of a W-2, and we don't have to worry with all these labor laws and all these other statutes concerning employees. So I can see the appeal why companies uh, will want to hire the services of an independent contractor. However, the problem with that is that it's very difficult to show that somebody is properly classified as an independent contractor, right? Like I said before, an independent contractor does not have to maintain timesheets, doesn't receive company-sponsored benefits like vacation, health, um, and um, it, it makes it very easy and very attractive. However, saying that somebody is an independent contractor alone does not mean that the person is an independent, independent contractor. Even if the individual signs an independent contractor agreement, that alone is not going to be proof that the person is an independent contractor. So over the years, we had different tests that were applied to determine whether or not somebody was properly classified as an independent contractor. And uh, we had uh, the economic reality test, which is a federal test. We had the, uh, the control test, which was an IRS test. We had our own control test here in the state of California that had like 20 different factors that needed to be considered, and we needed to do an analysis to see whether or not they were properly classified as independent contractors. Well, this new case, the uh, Dynamics case, actually simplified the test. Unfortunately, it made it harder to show that somebody is properly classified as an independent contractor, but it definitely simplified it. It made it very, very simple. The court says you only need to look at these three factors. That's why we call it the ABC test, because there's three factors, ABC factors that might be considered, okay? A couple of things before I go through those factors to keep in mind. Um, the, burn, the burden is on the employer, on the organization, on the company to prove that the person was properly classified as an independent contractor. So that is your burden as, as the, as the organization that retained the services of the individual, okay? And also, there's a presumption under state, under California law. Any person who's performing services for another is presumed to be an employee. So not only do you, ha do you have the burden, but we're starting with a presumption that they are employees and that you misclassify them as independent contractors, okay? So under the ABC test, a worker will be deemed to have been suffer or permitted to work, meaning that they're an employee, um, unless the company, the organization who's retaining the services, can prove all three of these factors, not one or the other, not two of the three, but all three of them. And the first one says the worker has been and will continue to be free from control or direction over the performance of their work, both under contract and in fact. This goes back to the original control test, okay? So the test is, is this individual who's providing the services, are they free from your control? Which means that the individual determines when to work, how to do the job, how long it's gonna take him, and the only contract that you have with them or the only agreement is that you're going to pay them a certain amount to perform a specific project, but how they do the project is up to them. 
this, I always say the best example of an independent contractor is when you want to redo your kitchen and you hire somebody to redo your kitchen. Now, you're not in the business of remodeling kitchens, but you're going to hire somebody who has a specialty, and you're going to pay them a certain amount of money to complete the project. Now, you may have some, you may have an expectation that they're going to finish the project, let's say, in three weeks. But if that independent contractor takes four weeks and says, look, we run into trouble, we have, I cannot make it in two days, chances are you're still going to pay them the money when they complete the kitchen. Okay? That's an independent contractor. So there has to be very little control over how the individual performs the services, and the only expectation that you have is of the final product. Number B says that the worker performs work that is outside the usual course of business of the hiring entity's business. And we're going to come back to that one because that's the main, the most problematic one. The third one says the worker is customarily engaged in an independent, established trade, occupation, profession, or business of the same nature as the work performed, meaning that that person has his or her own business. That's the this, that's this specific trait that they have. Right? In my example of the, of the kitchen remodeling, that person is in the construction industry. <clears throat> okay? <clears throat> but the main one, the most, <clears throat> the most difficult, difficult one to meet is B, because this says that the person who's performing the services, the service itself that's being provided must be outside the usual course of your business. Meaning that if you run a plumbing company and you want to hire a plumber, that plumber is providing the same services as the services that you provide to your clients. Therefore, that person cannot be an independent contractor. If your business is to um, paint houses, you cannot hire somebody to paint houses as an independent contractor. Um, that applies even to law firms like, like ours. We provide legal services. But if I were to hire, which we have done in the past, a contract attorney to provide, uh, you know, to help us when we are too busy and we need somebody to draft a brief or something to that effect, under this test, that person cannot be an independent contractor. He has to be an employee because he's performing the same services that we provide to our clients. So you can see under this test, uh, the, the Supreme Court of California made it very simple, but it made, it made it very difficult to meet the requirement of an independent contractor. So I will highly recommend that if you are retaining the services of any of an independent contractor, that you go back and, and make sure that there's no gray area there and that that person is properly classified as an independent contractor. Um, we're not going to have time to go through these best practices, but um, maybe we can cover a, a, a few of them. Um, make sure, again, that you go through the analysis to make sure that you are in compliance with the ABC test. Um, if you're going to have an independent contractor, even though the agreement itself is not, is not going to be sufficient to prove that they're independent contractors, you should still have one and make sure that it's properly drafted because it's going to help. Uh, avoid using former employees as independent contractors. Okay? If they're providing the same work that your employees perform, then most likely the person is not an independent contractor. Um, avoid using independent contractors to perform work that is integral to your business. I, I would go fur far further and say not avoid, just don't do it. Um, of course, an independent contractor must complete a W-9 because you're going to get a, a 1099, uh, 1099 at the end of the year. Keep your independent contractor files separate from your employee files, meaning with vendors or providers. Um, do not invite contractors to employee-only events or meetings, so you're not going to require them to attend mandatory meetings or training meetings because they're not your employee. Do not provide contractors with company business cards. Do not give them job titles. Um, deal with performance issues by modifying the contract that you have with them because remember that they're not your employees so there's no reason for you to be giving them a performance evaluation or things like that. Um, audit your um, arrangements, your independent contractor arrangements and 
when they provide the services, do not control how they provide the services to you. So that's the independent contractor. In summary, it's very unlikely that you, you, know, you shouldn't be using independent contractors. It's, uh, it, it's much better to have the people who provide your services be your employees. If you are using independent contractors, definitely consult with legal counsel to make sure that they're properly classified as independent contractors. The liability for misclassif misclassifying somebody as an independent contractor is huge, it's pretty significant. Because if they, if they are determined to be actual employees, now you have violations of not keeping higher uh, timekeeping records under the labor code, like timesheets, you're gonna have uh, potential overtime liability, uh, under the workers' comp, they have not been protected under FIHA, discrimination, harassment, laws, so significant. Lastly, I do want to cover the de minimis doctrine. Um, again, this was a case that was uh, decided last year, um, and let's start by a quick explanation of what we mean by the de minimis doctrine. The de minimis doctrine says that some work performed, some amount of work performed by an employee that is so small, it does not need to be recorded. So if somebody, let's say, uh, walks out of the office, walks out and, and signs off from work, right? They have completed the timesheet for the day. And all they have to do is make sure that the lights are off in the lobby, okay? That's gonna take them a minute to do, okay? So even though that time is not being compensated because it's not included in the timesheet, they're already clocked out, it's so minimal that it does not need to be compensated, okay? So then, of course, the question becomes, how many minutes of time is the minimus, and at what point do we need to make sure that we are compensating our employees for their work? So in this case, it was a case against Starbucks. It was a, a manager that they found spend between four and 10 minutes on a daily basis doing some, uh, some duties that he performed as part of closing the store after he had locked out of the computer, which means that he was not, get, not getting paid of that. So over a period of 17 months, that employee had worked about 12 hours of work. Over 17 months, that's over a year, a year and a half, that's not a lot of, a lot of time. But you can see how the, the minimum amount of time can add up over, over a period of time. Well, the court in this matter said that yes, that the, the manager should have been compensated for that time because it was possible for Starbucks to record the time. And it was not administratively difficult to do so. Okay. Now, the, this court, this, this court decision also says, we're not saying that the minimum doctrine does not exist or is not possible to apply. We're just find, finding that in this specific case, under this circumstances, he should have been paid. So the de minimis doctrine is still alive, but as you can see, it's not clear how you can avoid having liability. So what we are recommending to our clients is that you should be compensating your employees for all the time that they work. If for whatever reason they are required to perform five minutes of work after they have clocked out, then they should be including that even by hand on the following day or somehow in their timesheet. Also, if you have the practice of rounding time, which is still legal under California law, I still would still recommend against it. We have technology nowadays that allows you to pay your employees for every single minute that they work. And since we have a technology, it's a much safer uh, uh, um, approach uh, and procedure to just pay them for every single minute that they work. You're better off having to pay for three minutes of overtime than having to defend one of these claims. Because remember, the rationale behind the rounding laws and the de minimis is that administratively is difficult to keep track of those minutes. And again, since we have the technology today, that argument is getting more and more difficult to make. Okay? So uh, you should try the best that you can to uh, compensate your employees for all the time that they work. 
uh, you should have a very uh, you should have a a written policy that very clearly indicates to the employees that off the clock work is prohibited, and um, and you should probably have the employees acknowledge that on a separate piece of paper. Usually, we do it through the meal and rest period policy. If you have any questions <clears throat> about a de minimis or rounding, feel free to give me a call. <clears throat> Finally, because I know we're running out of time. Um, I just have to remind you about the new minimum wage that come into effect this year, right? So effective January 1st, 2019, if you have 25 or fewer employees, you are paying your employees $11 an hour. If you have 26 or more employees, you are paying your employees $12 an hour. That is the minimum, okay? Now, um, if you are in the city of LA or within other cities where they have their own minimum wage uh, laws, then you are paying employers, uh, I mean, if you have 25 or fewer employees, uh, let me go back here, I misread this, okay. If you have 26 or more employees, you're paying them 14.25 an hour. If you have less than 20, uh, 25 or fewer, you're gonna pay them 13.25 an hour. And then it also applies to not-for-profit corporations, but only if they have received approval from the state of California to pay the lower amount. And then if you have any salary employees, as you know, uh, you need to pay them twice the minimum wage. You do not need to consider the city of LA or any other city's minimum wage. The double the minimum wage is only based on the state minimum wage, the California state law. So in this case, it will be either $22 an hour or $24 an hour for our salary employees. So that's all I have for you guys for 2019. I'll be glad to answer some questions. If you have any questions. All right, very good. Um, Roxana, we do have some questions and we have a full house attending still. So why don't we go through a couple of those. And for those of you who haven't uh, typed in your question, please don't hesitate to do so. Um, and uh, you could also send a, um, a, a note to me. It's Greg at Landagger ESQ and I'll forward them on for a reply uh, for email. Um, one other uh, comment here, and this is about uh, our webinars, all come with uh, HRCI and SHRM credit. So for those of you who are interested, please do send me a note and ask me for a copy of the uh, certificate for uh, that you completed for the hour today. With that, then let me um, ask Roxana. Yes. Okay, let's see. First question here is, um, has to do with lactation accommodation. and. Uh, it says on slide uh, number three, uh, does it mean that we can't use our conference room that is a private room and locks because it is used for other purposes? Or does it mean that the space can't be used for something else during the time a lactation mother is using it? Right, and that, that's a good question. Uh, the the um, statute says that, and let me get to that because I want to make sure that I give you the right, um, information here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. slide number three. Right. So this uh so this states that um if if you okay um if it's not a permanent lo location, okay, it can be a temporary location if the employer is unable to provide a permanent location. So remember they the first choice is that they be a permanent location for lactation and that it be private and free from intrusion while being used for lactation purposes. And the, lact so, the temporary lactation is not used for other purposes while being used for lactation. So the, the idea here is that you have to make sure, if, you, if all you have is a conference room, that is fine, but you have to make sure that it does not get used for other purposes at the same time and that you take the steps necessary to ensure that there's not an interruption. Okay, I think that's clear. It should be uh, usable then, right? Yes, uh-huh. Okay, um, the next question had to do with retaliation. This is, how is the court going to define retaliatory behavior from the alleged when we can't state that they should not discuss the matter or talk about the employee that reported the case? I'm not sure if that's that clear, and we can ask that person to uh, go into that further if they like. 
Yeah, you can, you can send me an email. I, I might be able to give Rabbi with a better answer. I just, I'm not sure, quite sure what they mean. Okay, very good. All right. Well, at this point, we have uh, run out of time. And uh, any other questions, again, please forward them. We'll absolutely get back to you. And once again, thank you all for attending. It was lovely to have such a large crowd for our webinar. And we'll look forward to uh, notifying you of our next one coming up. Thank you all. Thank We're going to end the webinar now. Thank you. Bye-bye.